The year is 1997, and a much younger James clutches the box of a sequel to Dark Forces. He hasn't seen any playthroughs or watched any in-depth reviews because they didn't exist. He knows it's going to be good because it has LucasArts emblazoned upon it and Kyle Katarn engaged in lightsaber combat. Plus PC Gamer were raving over it and they were generally to be trusted. And it was better than my imagination could have envisaged, utilising the incredible new world of 3D acceleration and the Pentium processor. Higher frame rates than me or my brother had ever seen before outside of an arcade machine, with glorious 3D graphics and cinematic cutscenes. We were witnessing the future of gaming, and we knew it. The year after, we got Half-Life and Starcraft, and alongside Unreal, those titles changed everything we knew about gaming forever. Huge, fully voiced narrative campaigns, spanning hours, married with the pinnacle of gameplay that had been steadily honed to perfection in the years prior. Just what was this roller coaster going to bring next? How could they possibly top this? By the early 2000s, both 3D accelerated titles and narrative heavy games were commonplace, but BioWare took cinematic storytelling to the next level with Knights of the Old Republic on the newly created Xbox. It was like playing through a Star Wars movie, with every character in line uttered by them holding us captive, ensorcelled by the beauty of the artistry behind it all. Then Half-Life 2 appeared, and it was the pinnacle of everything leading up to this point. The gaming industry grew exponentially with each of these masterful releases, but with it came the inevitable. Several years later, and I didn't really play that many new games. It wasn't gaming that I'd lost interest in, and I wasn't so old that I was out of touch. Something had changed, and it wasn't me. As the industry grew bigger, innovation stalled on both a creative and technical level. New ideas were harder to come by, and with so much money at stake, it was better to stay tried and tested than push that boat out on a whim and a prayer. The gameplay that was once the hallmark of a title's uniqueness was sanded down to the point where you may as well have been playing the same title with a palette swap. Everything had become standardised and focus tested and the technological leaps had been purposefully held back by the desire to make as much money as possible out of the latest comparatively underpowered consoles, stifling Moore's Law by hobbling multi-platform releases of the time. The result of those safer bets was the downfall of the companies that used to make the games I loved. Now they had become cash focused entities with all the innovation washed clean, and the saddest part was that nobody took their place. By the time it ended, the only innovation to be found was through the indie scene, and the same fate befell that burgeoning movement as the rest of the gaming industry, as the corporate spotlight was shone upon it. Now all that's left is to sample the occasional standout title and play through nostalgia-driven remasters of the games I used to love, because the few that do try to ape their style are nothing but shallow copies, trailing far in their wake. At least until I can be thrown into the immersive world that will be full body haptic suits for VR or perhaps a brain implant. But with the money involved in both setting it up and in the industry now, it'll be a land of beige by the time I get there, and I'll be older and much more tired for having experienced it. So you'll have to forgive me for going back to the heady days of innovation when the world was a different and more unique place. You might have a backlog of modern digital titles numbering in the hundreds, but I have a backlog of unplayed history that will take me a lifetime to explore.